right, I have to start with a question. How many of you know what a spoiler alert is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let me, let me explain it for people who don't. If you're reading a review of a movie or a book or something and you see the word spoiler alert, it means that the review is about to give away the ending or give away some important plot twist, and if you keep reading, it could ruin it. Okay. So here's my spoiler alert. I'm about to give away the ending of pretty much every movie ever made. Um, and so if you haven't seen pretty much every movie ever made, um, I apologize now because I'm about to ruin it for you. Uh, last summer, I was asked to speak at the Second World Congress of the International Positive Psychology Association, which makes no sense because I'm not a psychologist, I'm a movie producer. Um, and as recently as two years ago, I'd never even heard of positive psychology. But one year ago, I read a book called Flourish by Dr. Martin Selleck. And in that book, he named what he calls the five elements of well-being. So I'd like to give those to you now. You can write them down if you like. It's only eight words. I'm not a big slide person, so if you write them down and then later you look at them, that's as close to a slide as you're going to get out of it. So here they are, the five elements of well-being. Number one, the first three you just heard Marty Sullivan talk about. Number one, positive emotions. Number two, engagement. Number three, meaning. And then since then, that, that talk was from 2008, he's added two more, positive relationships and positive accomplishments. So to Marty Seligman and his colleagues in positive psychology, these are the five elements of well-being. The more of these things you have in your lives, the more likely you are to be happy and optimistic and resilient. But when I first saw this list, not knowing what it was, I, I didn't know it was the five elements of well-being. I thought it was the five qualities of a good movie. I think that positive emotions, engagement, meaning, positive relationships, and positive accomplishments. And I got interested in the idea of, is there a correlation between the five things that make life worth living and the five things that make movies worth watching? And since our topic today is together, the word together, I thought I would focus just on those last two, positive relationships and positive accomplishments. Because I think when you look at those two elements of well-being through the lens of popular movies, you begin to get some sense of how we feel about them and how much we value them and whether we value one over the other. So the question becomes this, which matters more, saving the world or kissing the girl? <laughs> so let's start with positive accomplishments because that's the easy one. Everybody can see that there's a relationship between movie and, uh, movies and accomplishments. We're Americans. We love winners. We love people who are on top. The image of somebody jumping up and down at the end of a film, celebrating some victory, I think is a fairly standard. And I thought I would write down um, three examples of movies that end in positive accomplishments. There were thousands to choose from, but the three I happened to write down when I was first thinking about this were when Jennifer Grey makes the scary dance leap into Patrick Swayze's arms at the end of Dirty Dancing, when the Karate Kid makes the impossible kick that wipes out his opponent, and when King George VI finally gets through his wartime speech without stammering, to me, these accomplishments are among the great pleasures of the cinema. But then, I sat down with a man who runs an audience research film, a firm, one of those companies that oversees movie previews. Because I wanted to know, you know, I wanted to show him that list and to see if he thought there was a correlation between the list and movies that preview really well. And he looked at the list, and in about two seconds, he said, I can tell you one thing right now. Audiences don't care about accomplishments. And I said, what, what? And he said, audiences don't care about accomplishments. What they care about is the moment afterwards when the accomplishment is shared with the person the hero loves. So I went, I went back to my list and I looked at them and I went, wow, Dirty Dancing doesn't end with a leap. It ends with a scene in which Jennifer Grey reconciles with her father, who's the most important person in her life, when he says how beautiful she looked while she was dancing. And The Karate Kid doesn't end with a kick. If you've seen the more recent version, it, you see it over and over again on multiple screens. But after that, he reconciles with his opponent, and then he shares his victory with his mother and his dream. Uh, the last thing you see in the King's speech is not the speech, it's a card, white letters on a black background that says Lionel and Bertie remain friends for the rest of their lives. Lionel being the speech therapist and Bertie being the nickname for the King. And the movie didn't always end that way, it turns out. You can forgive them for 
thinking they were making a movie about a speech. It's called The King's Speech, after all, and that speech is one of the most important moments in British wartime history. But, but they wanted more than that. Um, and they have those scenes um, in which he reconciles with his, I mean, he not reconciles, but he shares his victory with the speech therapist, and with his family. But the audience wanted even more than that. They wanted to make sure that that friendship that they'd been watching develop over the course of that movie was a real friendship. It wasn't just a powerful man using another man for his own devices. That it was a real friendship and it went on forever. So what I began to realize was that in movie terms, over and over again, positive relationships trump positive accomplishments almost every time. And there are some interesting corollaries to this. For example, we forget how these movies end a lot of the time. And the perfect example is a woman I know whose favorite movie in the whole world is Dirty Dancing. She's probably seen it 150 times. And she's a studio executive, and we can set our watches when we're in meetings with her. How long goes by before she'll say, you know what this scene reminds me of? It reminds me of that scene in Dirty Dancing where Patrick sways, and then we start to laugh, and then she starts to laugh and says, what am I supposed to do? It's my favorite movie ever, ever. So I called her up, and I said, tell me something. What's the last thing that happens in Dirty Dancing? And she said, the leap. And I said, really? Acting all superior, is that right? <laughs> um, and she said, yeah, the leap, you know this. Jennifer Grey runs down the aisle, and she leaps into Patrick Swayze's arms, and he holds her up in the air like an airplane. And then he puts her down, and then they start to dance, and then the movie's over. And I said, when does she reconcile with her father? She said, well, before then. I said, I'm coming over. So I came over, I went over to her office and I brought the film with me and I showed her the last 10 minutes of the movie and she couldn't believe it. And what we realized was all this emotion that comes from the end of that movie that we were associating with that leap, the leap she was afraid to make at the beginning of the movie and now has the courage to make at the end of the movie, it wasn't coming from the accomplishment, it was coming from the relationship. And the other thing that's interesting is that when we make movies for men and boys, um, when we make movies for general audiences, which a lot of the time is men and boys. There, there's a structure that occurs again and again and again, not in every movie, but in a lot of those movies. And here's, here's how it goes. There's the hero, who's usually a man. There's um, the accomplishment, the goal that he has set himself to accomplish. And then there's the relationship. You get the accomplishment and the relationship because there's a primary relationship with him or his father, or a child, or with a best friend. So here's how it goes. He sets himself towards this relationship, I mean, towards this accomplishment, and he works really hard to get there, and there's all kinds of obstacles that he has to overcome, and then there's a terrible setback just before the end, and then he gets there, and he achieves his achievement, and then he realizes it doesn't mean anything without the relationship, and then there's a scene about the relationship. Okay. When we make movies for women, not all the time, but much of the time, the accomplishment is the relationship. The, the goal is love, and everything that's going on in the movie is about whether those two people that the movie is about are going to get together at the end or not. And it doesn't matter if it's The Notebook, or Notting Hill, or Bridesmaids, or The Vow, that's what's going on. Now, some people say that's patronizing to women, and some people say that's condescending to women, and some people say that's Hollywood's way of keeping women in their place. <laughs> but maybe what it really means out. <laughs> women don't need a whole movie to teach them that relationships are more important than accomplishments. They know that when they buy their ticket. So you can just dispense with all that saving the world stuff because they want to get right to the good stuff. And the good stuff is the relationship. Now, by this point, I got to know Marty Seligman, and I called him up, and I said, tell me something, if you put that list of the five elements of well-being in front of men and women, do they react to it differently? And he said, yeah. In general, men will tell you that accomplishments are the most important thing, and women will tell you it's relationships. Okay. But think about this. We try really hard in the movie business to end our movies at the moment of peak audience satisfaction. So if men really value accomplishments more than relationships, wouldn't we end their movies in a different place? Wouldn't we end Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol at the moment when the disarmed nuclear missile bounces off the Transamerica building instead of with a scene of four people at a table? 
Wouldn't we end Transformers Dark of the Moon when the Autobots defeat the Decepticons instead of a scene where the guy says to the girl, you're the only thing in this world that I need? Wouldn't we end the final Harry Potter movie when Harry kills Voldemort? He's been trying to kill Voldemort for seven books and eight movies. <laughs> and if you look at the trailer for that last Harry Potter movie, you'd swear that's the only thing going on in the movie is whether or not he's going to kill Voldemort. But do we end the movie where he kills Voldemort? No. We end it years later when he's grown up at a train station with his wife and his children and his friends. So maybe what's going on here when we make movies for men and boys is a giant bait and switch. We say, we say, here's a movie about saving the world. Here's a movie about giant alien robots. Here's a movie about killing the evil wizard. But what we deliver is a movie about relationships. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, for men and women, the accomplishment is the relationship. So you can't really talk about accomplishments and relationships in movies without talking about Rocky. Uh, when I give this talk in smaller groups, inevitably by this point, someone will have interrupted me and said, what about Rocky? What about Rocky? Everything you're talking about is Rocky. There's the accomplishment and there's the relationship. He, there's the accomplishment and then he shares it with someone he loves. He wins the fight and then he says, yo, Adrian, I did it. <laughs> so let's talk about Rocky. Um, when I was in Philadelphia last summer, I had the chance to visit the famous Rocky Steps, the ones that he runs up in the movie. And keep in mind, this was during that terrible heat wave they were having last summer. Uh, the heat index that particular day in Philadelphia was 115 degrees. And there were doctors on radio and on television begging people not to go outside, saying literally, if, if you go outside and exercise today, you will die. <laughs> so I took a taxi to the top of the Rocky Steps, and I walked out on, uh, you know, this is the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and I walked out onto the uh, top of them, and every five minutes, there was somebody running the steps, all 72 of them, bottom to top, getting to the top, turning around, jumping up and down, pumping their fists in the air, and having their picture taken. And, and I began to realize that there was more going on there than just tourism. Because I would see people with tears pouring down their faces as they were running those steps. And it turns out there's a wonderful book called Rocky Stories, in which a journalist interviewed people who ran those steps. He spent a year interviewing those people, and there's wonderful photographs in it. And um, what he found was that people were coming from all over the world to celebrate some personal victory by imitating Rocky. So, for example, if you look at the book, you'll see there's two women who've been friends for 45 years who are jumping up and down at the top of the Rocky Steps to celebrate that long friendship. And there's a man who's had a heart transplant who's come all the way to Philadelphia to run the steps to celebrate his recovery. And there'll be a boy who'll say, if I could just get that girl to marry me, I'd marry her on top of the Rocky Steps. The day I was there, Three different weddings were waiting to go on at the same time. Hot tuxedos, hot bridal gowns, hot bridesmaids' dresses. And the thing is, that movie came out 36 years ago, and none of those people was older than 36. So it just shows you the power of the inspiration of that movie and how long it's lasted. So Rocky, as most of you probably know, is the story of a washed-up boxer who ends up going 15 rounds against the world heavyweight champion Apollo Creed. It won the Academy Award for Best Picture. It was a huge financial hit. It's on the American Film Institute's list of the greatest American movies ever made. It's actually number four on their list of the most inspirational American movies ever made. It has spawned five sequels so far and hundreds of imitators. And almost every single one of those sequels and imitators has copied that Rocky formula, that formula of the underdog who wins, right down to the smallest detail, except one. And the one detail that they almost never copied is the fact that Rocky didn't win. In the original Rocky movie, Rocky doesn't win. He doesn't say, yo, Adrian, I did it, because he didn't do it. He says that at the end of Rocky II, where he does win the fight, and then he wins the fight in Rocky III and Rocky IV and Rocky V. But in that first Rocky movie, the one that's number four on the American Film Institute's list of the most inspirational movies ever made, Rocky loses the fight. Talk about a movie where people don't remember how it ends. Talk about a movie where there's 
power of the relationship overwhelms people's memory of everything that happened before them. But I got interested in that list of the most inspirational movies ever made because what I began to notice is how many of those movies are about heroes who don't win, how many of them don't get what they want. For example, I'll give you some other examples from, from their top ten inspirational movies. George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. All he wants is to travel the world. Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird has a client who's been falsely accused of a terrible crime, and all he wants is for that man to be set free. Lil Elliot wants E.T. to be his friend forever. The Joad family in, its, in, the, in The Grapes of Wrath come to California seeking prosperity, and none of them get what they want. So what gives? If, if there's no positive accomplishment, at the end of those movies, and no victory to be celebrated afterwards, then what makes these movies so inspirational? Why are people still jumping up and down on the Rocky steps 36 years later if Rocky lost the fight? And I think the answer is that what's being celebrated at the ends of those movies is something else. And it's not as enormous as saving the world, and it's not quite as simple as kissing the girl. What's being celebrated at the ends of those movies is each other, is the tenderness and the kindness and the comfort of each other. At the end of It's a Wonderful Life, when George Bailey has returned from the depths of despair, the angel says to him, no man is a failure who has friends. At the end of E.T., when little Elliot is heartbroken by the spaceship's departure, we know he'll be comforted by the family that surrounds him. At the end of To Kill a Mockingbird, when a series of terrible events has been succeeded by a series of beautiful ones, Atticus Finch's little daughter sums it all up by talking about neighbors. Neighbors, she says, who bring food with death and flowers with sickness and the little things in between. And at the end of the first Rocky movie, he doesn't say, oh, Adrian, I did it. And he doesn't even kiss her. He just clutches her with all of the strength he has left in his body while they say, I love you, over and over again to each other.